I think we should go play in the sprinklers today, guys. <laughs> that looks pretty refreshing. What's the last time you played in the sprinkler? This morning. <laughs> out today. Thank you for being here. Uh, I think it's going to be hot again today, but uh, the air conditioning works, all right? So thank you for coming to use uh, use our air conditioning instead of yours for a couple of hours. Uh, let me direct your attention to the screen behind me to our morning welcome and announcement video. Community Church. We're so glad that you've decided to join us this morning. Hey, if you do me a favor, if you're a guest with us today, welcome. If you would grab one of those connect cards right in front of you and uh, fill out that information, let us know that you were here. We would love to get you some information on some of the exciting things that are going on here at New Hope. One of those exciting things are happening on August 5th. Check it out. Greetings from Uganda. Hey everybody, we're looking forward to seeing you August 5th. We'll be with you during all of the services. And what else are we going to do? Well, we're doing something a little different this year. We're calling it the Village Encounter. Ooh, tell me more. Well, have you ever wanted to see what it's like to live in Africa? Definitely. I want to know what it's like to cook like an African or to carry water on my hand. All of those things. I bet you guys are wondering what it's like also. Well, we're going to give you an opportunity to do just that. So come on out. You can come just by yourself or bring the whole family. And we're going to have starting times at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 4 o'clock. All of it ending at 5 o'clock for evening church service. And some of the activities that we're going to have, shall we, are what? Well, there's going to be different stations that you can walk through. Um, very educational, find out a little bit more about life here in Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, we're also going to have a village market. Ooh, shop shopping. Shopping, yes. I know a lot of you are now coming who weren't coming before. That's right. This will give you an opportunity to um, purchase some of the products that our girls have been busy making at New Life Skills Center. What are you going to do with the kids to keep them busy while they go for shopping? Well, we're going to have ice cream. Ice cream social, so come out and make yourself a Sunday. We look forward to seeing you the August 5th, and uh, we're excited to see all of you again and to catch up a bit. So, we'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, Baptism Sundays on August 26th this year. Come join us in our 9 15 and 11 o'clock service to see people declare Jesus as Lord in their life. If you're interested, email office at newhomechurch.net or write baptism on the back of your connect card. We hope to see you there. Are you looking to get plugged in here at New Hope? Maybe to serve in some different ways? Well, if you go to newhopechurch.net, go to ministries, uh, click on that. On the bottom of that, it says serving opportunities. There's a whole list of places where you can serve at New Hope, where you can get to know new people, where you can plug into the student ministry. The kids ministry, uh, the prime timers ministry, the heart to heart ministry. We have so many different ministries we would love for you to plug into. So go to newhopechurch.net, click on ministries, click on serving opportunities, and get hooked up there. If you don't have the internet, feel free on that connect card to say, hey, I want to serve, and tell us where we would love to get in contact with you. We can't wait to connect with you and get you plugged into New Hope on a whole different level. Hey ladies, Saturday, September 1st is our ladies' comedy night. The comedian of the night is going to be Amy Barnes. She's super funny. Check this out. You guys like to eat out with your kids? I don't like to eat out with my kids very much. I don't like to eat out. Ever since my daughter learned how to read, she orders up a menu like she has an expense account. <laughs> She'll look down at menu. I think I'm going to start with can't even finish a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You're going to start with water. You're going to finish with what's left on my plate. Mom, what's catching the day? It's chicken nuggets. Fresh from the sea. So make sure you save the day 
is Saturday, September 1st. Tickets will go on sale soon. You don't want to miss this. Hey, Amen. Saturday, August 11th, we have men's breakfast again. We're back. You don't want to miss this breakfast. We got a little sneak peek about Man Camp 2018. So don't miss it. Coffee's on at 7.30. It's going to be an awesome time. That's Saturday, August 11th, men's breakfast. We'll see you there. Hey guys, next Sunday we have over 80 campers in high school and elementary school going up the mountain to encounter Jesus. I am myself and one of those and I'm super excited to have my Devo time with God. So keep us in your prayers and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. Our vision at New Hope is to compellingly communicate the all-absolute sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. If you are in need and need some extra prayer, on the back of that Connect card, just write out your prayer request. We as a staff pray for those every week. We would love to join you in prayer. Thanks again so much for coming. We hope today that you meet with Jesus in new and exciting ways. I got a clipboard coming around. This is for Women's Bible Study that starts on August the 1st. Tina Brown is the Matilda's facilitator. will be leading that. They're going to be studying the book of Ephesians. Uh, if you've already signed up, you don't need to sign up again. But if you haven't signed up, they want to be sure to have enough material. And so that's on a Wednesday morning. Uh, Chris briefly talked about areas of service in the church, and this is very, very impromptu. Uh, I'm going to ask Kendra and Irma to stand up real quick, if you would. Irma and Kendra. All right? I understand you did something this week that's the first time you've ever done it. What was it, Irma? You helped serve at a reception for a memorial service here. You did that on Friday for uh, the service we had for Bernice's daughter. All right, Charlene. And you said something a few minutes ago when I asked you, uh, we were talking about your serving. What did you say? Use your outside teacher, oh, my first, teach, first grade teacher voice. It was an amazing experience. Um, we had a chance to um, get to know a lot of new faces, new people, and just we really thoroughly enjoyed it. It was hard work, but we, we loved it. My what did you do? We actually served food while we set up and um, started off with cutting all the desserts. And we were running back and forth, putting those on the table, and then we actually had a chance to serve, and then cleaned up afterwards, and met new faces at our church that we had never met before. And so Will you ever do it again? Of course. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you for the testimonial. So. Uh, you can sign up either using the cards in the pew in front of you, or you can go online and do that. And there's all other kinds of areas to serve. Uh, if you have a trouble navigating that system, just call the office and they'll help you get through it as well. So thank you all for doing that this past week. We appreciate it so, uh, so very, very much. Um, I got to tell you what, guys. I just got a little dose of energy, which I was needing this morning from a text. Uh, yesterday, we did a memorial service for uh, a young man, 41 years old, graduated from Clovis High School. I had the privilege of marrying him and his wife, Jessa, uh, back in 2011. Uh, the service was held at the well. They let us use their facility for the service. We knew it would be a bigger crowd than probably what we could hold. There was about 400 uh, people there. Uh, I had those who went to high school with them who were present stand that were probably close to uh, 85 to 100 of the people who were present who went to high school with him. And I just got a text from a young man who was there. I'm not gonna throw out his name, all right? I'm not throwing him under the bus. Uh, I've known this family oh, 30 years now. Uh, one of his brothers played baseball with my son all through elementary, junior high, and high school. So I've had a lot of connection with his family, and that brother was present at the service yesterday. He sent me a text last night. I didn't have his number in my phone. I didn't know who it was. I responded pretty early this morning because he sent it rather late last night, which is saying I was with his parents until just a few minutes ago. They needed today. Today was great for them. Thank you for making a tough time 
better for them. I responded fairly early, he responded quickly, and I said, oh, you're an early riser too? So we had a little chit chat, and I just got a text from him, listen to this. I've never been to church, but I want to start. <laughs> and so out of sometimes these kind of things, and I gotta be honest, I've gotten to work with this particular age group, when I've had multiple times to kind of engage in the situations, I've gotten to where I'm pretty straightforward about the gospel at the end. And uh, I left them yesterday with who's going to stand in the gap because Jeremy had become a Christian four years ago. And I said, who's going to stand in the gap in his place? And uh, gave them a chance to invite Christ in their life. So that, that was kind of it. I just got it. I was tired this morning, man. So now, now I feel good. All right, this is this is good. Uh, let's see. Fawn Boss is not able to be with us today. They got back from vacation, and she is sick. All right. So I'm only going to be praying for Fawn, but I do want. Hey, you want to come here? This gal, you've heard a little snippet of it. She is hilarious. She is really, really good. We've had her once before a few years ago, and so get a chance to have her back. So, ladies, put that on your uh, schedule. Bring somebody with you. It'll be a great night of refreshment. And I hope you'll be able to make that one. Uh, it's going to be so much fun to have the Actus family back home. Uh, for those of you who are newer to our church, the couple you saw in the interview from Africa, Village Encounter Day, they are homegrown out of New Hope Church. They have served four years in Columbia, where they planted a church. When they finished their four years there, they got a real clear call from God that they needed to learn a whole other language. Because God was sending them to Africa. And so now they are in the country of Uganda. And they have served there now almost uh, two and a half years. They're coming home for a uh, brief furlough. They've done some incredible things where they are. We can't wait to hear about it. So this is one of our own uh, that God has picked up from here. It's in there. He was a former Clovis, uh, Clovis East teacher. And so uh, now they are ministering in Uganda, Africa. So that's two weeks from today. And I'm very, very excited about having them. Home. Uh, Sharon Hames uh, and her husband, they have a granddaughter who just gave them a great grandchild, right? Am I figuring that out correctly? All right. And uh, here's the deal this doesn't happen too often. Uh, Dad is home taking care of baby while mom is still in the hospital. So I'm not sure which one you need to pray more for, all right? <laughs> Uh, Mama has, uh, they found out, just got the word, they found out the infection, uh, where the source of it is. She does have, she's been running the temperature, uh, but they have found the source of the infection. They're treated, hopefully in just a couple of days she will get to go home. But please be praying for Nicole as they treat this infection and for the Hogman family, the arrival of this new baby. Donna Walters, who normally is in this service, uh, sits on the back row when she gets here. Uh, she's had some health challenges, went to the doctor this week, and uh, got sick. So she still has some health challenges. So please be praying for uh, Donna. Um, let's see here. Greg. Uh, Greg's son, Jason, we've been praying for him for the last couple of weeks. He's 39. Is my memory right? 38 years old. He's in the state of Washington. He's been in ICU. He's been on... Uh, He's been on a lot of equipment, all right, to keep his life going while they've tried to figure out ways to give him some life and quality of life. Uh, they are going to be driving up this evening to Washington, so we want to pray for Greg and Shelley, and uh, it appears that there's not any other options. So uh, just be praying for them as important decisions are going to be made over the next 24 hours. Jason knows Jesus. He loves Jesus. He knows where he's going. He's not afraid of what he's facing right now. But uh, do be praying for Greg and Shelby as they make this trip up and as they spend time together with Jason and the family at this very, very important time. Um, all of these families that you see for comfort for our services that we've had this past week, uh, I have four. Chris did his very first graveside service in his ministry, in his life. He did a service for one of his students' moms who passed away. So uh, thank you for praying for him as he did that pray for those families, and then there are a couple of more coming up in the next two weeks. So please be praying for all of these families. I know they would appreciate it so very, very much. Be praying for John Miller uh, as he continues to go through his battle with leukemia. Uh, update in the last 48 hours. Still saying. All right, all right. So just be praying that uh, the medication keeps him comfortable and 
and uh, be praying for his wife Jeannie as she's his 24-7 caregiver for strength and stamina. And uh, John's going home is not that far down the road. He's ready. So we just need to, to pray for that, 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 the walk through the valley of the shadows. And uh, I know they would appreciate that. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? Mark, welcome back. Good to see you. All right, he's through selling fruit. For a while, anyway. All right, all right. Uh, part the waters, one of the things to get through. All right, all right. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the life that you share with us so very, very much. We, uh, we trust you with our needs. Some weeks are more challenging than others. Some weeks are physically tiring, some weeks are mentally and emotionally tiring. But Father, thank you that we never have to be spiritually tired. You tell us that you are our strength, you are our sufficiency. You tell us that we are to bring our needs and leave them with you. You tell us that we are to come to you and find rest for our souls. And so today we do that, Lord. We thank you for the little gifts that you give to us that encourage us, that put our energy level back where, where it needs to be. So Father, we thank you for the gifts that you so generously give to us. Father, sometimes these weeks are reminders that uh, it's not about our abilities or our strength or our fortitude that is the way we're to live life. But Father, these are weekly reminders that tell us life, both in the good days and the challenging days, are to be lived in dependence upon you. Our sufficiency for the regular routine things should be the same as it is when we face the big challenges of life. So, Father, today we all bring to you our needs, and I trust we will leave them with you. And we will leave today being more refreshed in the way in which we arrived. Father, we lift up to you families that have experienced some real challenges in recent days. The unexpected uh, deaths of husbands and dads, sons and daughters. Thank you, Father, that death doesn't have the last word, but we find great hope in knowing that life does. We find great hope in knowing that we all have a home in heaven and you prepared it for us. And I trust that we share with our family and friends their need to prepare for heaven. Father, for what you want to do and say in our midst today, may we give you absolute freedom and may we have ears that are very attentive to your direction in our own lives personally. May we have the the willingness to obey your leadership in our lives. Lord, we commit this and so much more to you in the incredible name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I gotta tell you, so this morning did not go as I had planned. And sometimes that happens in life, doesn't it? Uh, as you know, we had four memorial services to prepare for this week, and every single one of them was somewhat different. One of them was Bernice's family, and so I knew there would be a lot of church family there, and you all have heard about all my best stuff at memorial services. So I had to work on something new. I had two 41, 42-year-olds this weekend. They both were graduates from the same high school, and I knew there would be many of the same people at both of those services. So I couldn't double up and use the same material. So it was a lot more work in the office this week than what it normally is. And so uh, I was about 60% finished with the sermon on heaven this morning as of 9 p.m. last night. So I figured not a problem. Get up at 4.30 most of the time on Sunday mornings. We'll wrap it up this morning. A little closer than normal, but we'll get it wrapped up. I didn't get it wrapped up. <laughs> I was not happy at uh, 6.20 this morning with where we were going to be. And so really what I have to confess to you is I'm not up to heaven today. <laughs> For those of you who may be new, the theme that we're preaching all summer is what's up with heaven. And I'm just not up to where we were going to be. I didn't like the way it was going to wrap up, but it wasn't going to be good. And it was at that moment that, you know, God said, hey, do you remember that commercial you were listening to earlier this week? And I sort of whispered in your ear and said, that's a sermon. 
I said, yeah, the Lord, it's 6.20. And so as I'm arguing with the Lord a little bit this morning, um, I typed in, in my search engine under sermons, the subject that connected to that commercial, which I'll get to in just a moment. And son of a God, I preached a sermon pretty close to that in 2011. You all remember it? <laughs> That's what God said. He said they won't remember it. <laughs> so I pulled it out and I looked at it. I said, you know what? The few changes, this fits perfectly with what. So today, you're getting one, not on heaven, but how you and I need to live between now and then. All right? Here's the commercial. Some of you may have heard it. Here's the key line in the commercial. Fear is not an investment strategy. Have you guys heard that commercial? I think it's primarily on Saturday mornings when on K&J they have the finance gurus on for a program. And so it's for whatever. Mike, but what's that company that they talk about on Saturday mornings on the investment show on K&J? Find a store? Which store? Funds, mutual fund store? Yeah, some mutual fund store. I can't remember what the name of the company is. But anyway, I've heard it a couple of weeks, and every time I've heard it, I thought, that's a, that's a great line. Fear is not an investment strategy. And I would suggest to you this morning that fear is not a faith lifestyle strategy. And yet, I fear a lot of Christians live more out of fear than they do out of faith. What does God have to say about that? That's what we're going to look at this morning. One dark night outside of a small town, a fire started inside a local chemical plant. Before long, it was in flames, and an alarm went out for all the fire departments from miles around to come and battle this fire. After fighting the fire for over an hour, the chemical company president approached the fire chief and said, all of our secret formulas are in a file in a vault in the center of that building. They must be saved. I will give $50,000 to the engine company that keeps them safe. As soon as the chief heard this, he ordered his firemen to strengthen their attack on the blaze. After two more hours of attacking the fire, the president of the company came back up again and said, I will give you $100,000 to the company that keeps my file safe. From the distance, a long siren was heard and another truck came into sight. It was a local volunteer fire company composed of men all retired 65 years and older. To everyone's amazement, that little fire engine raced through the chemical plant gates, drove right into the middle of the inferno. In the distance, the other firemen watched as the old timers hopped off the rig, began to fight the fire with an effort they had never witnessed before. After an hour of intense fighting, the volunteer company had extinguished the fire and saved the secret files. Very thrilled, the chemical company president announced that he would double the reward to $200,000, and he walked over to personally shake the hand and thank every one of those 65 plus year old volunteers. After thanking each one of them, the president of the company looked at the truck driver right in the eye and said, Sir, what are you going to do with the reward money that you're going to receive? The man looked at him and said, The first thing we're going to do is fix the brakes on that old truck. <laughs> it's not that they were fearless or overly courageous. Somebody once said that necessity is the mother of invention, and I would suggest that crisis is the father of opportunity. That commercial that I heard recently, Fear is Not an Investment Strategy, is a basis today for a message called Fear is Not a Lifestyle Strategy either. There's a lot of things that people can be afraid of. There was a book written about uh, 20 years ago, I think now, and it made the top 10 list, all right? And it was on the top 10 list for, I want to think, something like 15 to 18 weeks. And it talked about a lot of fearful things we could encounter. For example, the next time an octopus tracks you on the ocean floor, don't be afraid. Just launch into a flurry of somersaults. And unless you are wrapped in the grip of a fearfully strong tentacle or two, you'll escape with only a few lesions from the suckers. 
As you ascend to the surface of the ocean, you might encounter a shark, but don't panic. Just punch them in the eyes or the gills are right on the nose. That's the most sensitive part of the body. The same holds for alien encounters. Foil your next UFO abduction by going straight for the invader's eyes, but guard your thoughts carefully. Maybe put some foil around your head. Space creatures might be able to read your mind. But gorillas can't read your mind. They can lock you in their grasp. The grip of a silverback is padlock tight. Your only hope of escape is to gently stroke his arm and smack your lips. You see, primates are fastidious groomers. Hopefully, that silverback will interpret your actions as a spa treatment. If not, things could be worse. You could be falling from the sky in a malfunctioning parachute, you could be trapped in a plummeting elevator, or you could have been buried alive in a steel coffin. You could be facing your worst case scenario in life. We, we've all had them. The ultimate desperation moments. That's why that book, entitled The Complete Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook, did make it to the top ten list. Thanks to that book, you and I can learn how to react to a grabbing gorilla or an abducting alien. However, I have to confess to you, the odds of such occasions are very, very remote in your life and mine. I've not lost any sleep over octopus or gorillas, but I have stayed away pondering some other rather gloomy scenarios. I've got to be honest, growing senile is one of my biggest fears. The thought of growing old doesn't trouble me much. I don't mind losing my hair, my teeth, my youth, but the thought of losing my mind is dreadful. And maybe a few of you could advise me on that if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> Failing to provide for my family has been another thing that's haunted me through the years. Have I done enough? As I've gotten older, it's not, have I done enough financially for my family? <clears throat> I'll be honest, on the side of 60 that I find myself, my biggest concern is, have I done enough spiritually for my family? Do they love Jesus as much as my parents do? Do they love Jesus as much as I do? Do they love Jesus as much as they should? These are lurking fears. These are uninvited Loch Ness monsters. These are not pedestrian anxieties like the common cold. These could be lingering horrors of some inescapable talent, fear, and regret. Illogical and maybe even unexplainable, but they're still undeniable. Have you already began in this brief intro to this sermon to begin to think about what your worst fear is? What, what is your worst fears? A fear of public failure? Of unemployment? Of high places? The fear that you'll never find the right spouse or enjoy good health? The fear of being trapped, abandoned, or forgotten? All real feelers, born out of some very legitimate concerns, yet left unchecked, these fears will metastasize into obsessions. You see, it's a very small step from prudence to paranoia, and that small step is very, very short and often it's very, very steep. You see, prudence wears a seatbelt, paranoia avoids cars. Prudence washes with soap. Paranoia becomes Howard Hughes and he avoids human contact. <laughs> By the way, how many of you remember the name Howard Hughes? Okay, all right. I, I, I'm discovering I'm dating myself sometimes in examples that I use. <laughs> I mentioned that at memorial service the other day because a guy was born on the same day as, um, as Jack Klugman. 
and I got a bunch of blank stares. I said, Quincy, I got more blank stares. Okay, it wasn't a good choice. Paranoia saves for old age. Paranoia hoards even trash. Prudence prepares and plans. Paranoia panics. Prudence calculates the risk and then takes the plunge. But paranoia never, ever enters the water. The word plunge in water comes to mind as I not long ago read a story about a man at the edge of a hotel swimming pool. He sees a father and his two small daughters at play, and, 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 and the dad's in the water, and, 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 and the daughters are jumping into his arms. But well, let me restate that. One daughter jumps into the father's arms. The under, other one ponders the jump. The dry one gleefully watches her sister leap up and land in the water, and she dances up and down on the end of the board while the other one splashes. But, but when Dad invites her to do the same, she says no and backs away. It's a living parable. How, how many people spend their life on the edge of the pool, consulting caution, ignoring faith, never taking the plunge, happy to experience life vicariously through others, preferring no risk at all than any risk sometimes? You see, for fear of the worst, you never enjoy life at its best. That's why fear is not a lifestyle strategy of faith. By contrast, though, the sister jumps, not with foolish abandon, but with the belief in the goodness of a father's heart and the trust of her father's arms. This was the choice of Jesus. He did more than speak about fear. You and I must understand Jesus faced fear. The decisive acts of the gospel drama are played out on two stages with Jesus. In Gethsemane's garden and on Golgotha's cross. Friday's cross witnessed the severest suffering anybody has ever been through. Thursday's garden staged the profoundest fear anyone has faced. It was in the garden in the middle of a bunch of olive trees that Jesus fell to the ground and he prayed that if it was possible, this awful hour that was imminently in his future would pass. If you want to look it up in the Bible, it's found in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14. It's verses 35 and 36. And you find these words recorded. Jesus prayed, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done in me. Some have criticized preachers over the years for trying to picture Jesus with fear. Max Licato, an author and a pastor, described him at this moment as eyes wide with the stupor of fear. But you and I need to take courage. These are sentiments of Scripture, not mere man. Mark 14, 33 has been rendered in various translations where Jesus said, My soul is overwhelmed. Horror has overcome me. And if this is in the Bible, it's all inspired, God-breathed words of Scripture. And I know we've never seen Jesus like this before in the Bible. Not when he faced a Galilean storm or the demonics, the Acropolis, or as he was on the edge of the Nazarene cliff. We've never heard such screams from his voice or seen his eyes blind. Never, ever, ever have we read a sentence. He plunged into agony. This is a weighty matter, a weighty moment in history. God has become flesh, and flesh is feeling the full bore of fear. What was Jesus afraid of and why? It has something to do, according to the prayer, with the cup. Father, let this cup pass for me. What was this cup? 
Was it an arrest? Was it a beating? Was it being naked in a public square and abused? Was it being nailed to a wooden cross? Propped up for all the world to see and notice? Guys, I don't think any of that would have scared Jesus. I think the cup had to do with the relationship between the Father and the Son. I think the cup had to do with the wrath of God upon the sinfulness of your life and mine that Jesus now became. You see, Jesus had never felt God's anger because he never deserved it. Jesus had never experienced isolation from his heavenly Father, for the two had been tied together throughout eternity. Jesus had never been touched by sin, and now all of a sudden Jesus knew he who knew no sin would become sin. Because all the sins of the world, yours and mine, would be placed on him and he would become what he had never known. Jesus had never known physical or spiritual death, for he was an immortal being. And yet, in the next few days, he would go through both. God was going to unleash his sin-hating wrath on the sin-covered son. And Jesus sensed fear. It is at this moment that I think you and I can learn what to do with our fears. Because what Jesus did with his fears then show us what to do with our fears now. What did he do? You better get your pen and paper out and write this down so you never forget it. He prayed. Isn't that profound? God the Son got into a mode of earnest prayer with God the Father. Jesus told a small group of his most tight-knit friends. He left nine of the disciples at the bottom of the hill. He asked Peter, James, and John, come a little further with me. Do you have any friends that you could say, come a little further with me? <clears throat> and then Jesus sat them down and said, sit away here. I'm going to go right over there. And my father and I are going to have a conversation. And on that day, one prayer was not adequate. That passage in Mark's Gospel, as well as in Matthew chapter 26, the scripture says, again, a second time, Jesus went away and prayed. And then he prayed the third time, saying the same words all three times. He even requested the support of his friends. Verse 41, Matthew 26. Could you guys stay awake a little while? And pray for some. Could you all stay awake until I finish the sermon? <laughs> Jesus said, could you stay awake until I finish my prayer? I don't want to overcomplicate this topic, folks. We often do that, it seems like, with spiritual matters. We overcomplicate something that God has made very simple for us. We describe words for prayers, places for prayer, clothing for prayer, postures of prayer, durations of prayer, intonations and incantations of prayer. Yet Jesus' garden appeal had none of these. It was brief. His prayer was 26 English words. It was very straightforward. Please take this cup of suffering away. And yet trusting. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. This prayer was low on style and slick, but it was high on real and authentic. This is less the prayer of a silver-tongued saint in a sanctuary. This was more of a prayer of a frightened child on a father's lap. In fact, that's exactly it. Jesus' garden prayer is a child's prayer. Notice how he addressed his father. Abba. 
That's Papa. That's dear Daddy. This is the most intimate word for a child-parent relationship. There wasn't that language. It was just Jesus saying, Daddy, let me climb into your lap and tell you what I fear. Well, I remember as a small child getting in my daddy's lap in the car. He'd be arrested. We would be arrested for doing such a thing today. But in those days, it wasn't unusual for a father to take his young child and put him on his lap behind the wheel of a car. I mean, when we drove from Kerman to Calway, there were more jackrabbits than people. And he'd put me on his lap and he'd let me steer the wheel. It didn't make any difference that my feet couldn't touch the brake. It didn't make any difference that I couldn't touch the accelerator. It didn't matter that I couldn't even see over the dashboard. It didn't make any difference that I didn't know the difference between a radio and a carburetor. But I got to help my dad drive. There were occasions when he even let me choose the route. At an intersection, he would say, right or left, and I would choose, and with gusto, I would whip the wheel in that direction. Did I ever fear driving into a ditch or overturning on the curb or running the tire uh, into the curb? By no means. Dad's hands were next to mine. His eyes were keener than mine. His knowledge of our circumstances was wiser than mine. Consequently, I was fearful. See, any of us can drive from the lap of our Father. And I suggest to you today, any of us can live from the lap of our Heavenly God. And any can pray from that same position. Prayer is the practice of sitting calmly in God's lap and placing our hands on the wheel. He handles the speed and the curves and ensures our arrival. And we offer our requests. We suggest. We suggest not demand. We suggest not to take this cup. The cup of disease, of betrayal, of financial ruin, of joblessness, of conflict, of grief or civility. Pr pr prayer is this simple. And such simple prayer equipped Christ to stare down his deepest fears. And here's what I want you to notice about this prayer. Did God the Father answer the prayer of His Son? That's not a trick question. The answer is yes. Did He answer it the way the Son requested? No. He may not answer your prayers or my prayers the way I desire, but He answers the prayer with what is best. What was the worst for Jesus turned out to be the best for you and me. Sometimes what may be the worst for us turns out to be the best for somebody else in the influence of our life. We can leave that to God, but what He can do is wipe away our fears. And what did, what did Jesus do at the end of His prayer time? He gathered His sleepy buddies and He walked to the bottom of the hill and who met Him there? The centurions to arrest Him. Did Jesus run and hide? Did he scream and cry? Why? Because the fears were gone. Because he was sitting in the lap of the Father. The Father was at the wheel. Did he pull out a sword to fight? No, no Peter tried that. Jesus had to clean up the mess. <laughs> he still had the same trouble ahead of him. But he was no longer afraid. Because he and his Father were in this together. You and I need to do likewise. We need to fight our dragons in the Gethsemane's garden. Those persistent, ugly villains of the heart. We need to talk to God about them. I don't want to lose my spouse, Lord. Help me to fear less and trust more. I have to fly on a plane tomorrow, Lord. I can't sleep because I'm worried about terrorists on board or the plane crashing. Remove that fear. The bank just called and they're about to foreclose. What's going to happen to my family? Teach me to trust. There's a chaplain at my door from the police department. I know it's not good news. Make him go away. I'm scared, Lord. The doctor just called and the news isn't good. You know what's ahead. 
I'm going to give you my fears. We need to be specific about our fears. We pray, identify what the cup is and talk to God about it. Putting our worries into words disrobes them. And i got to be honest. Our fears strip naked. They look funny. But we dress them up and we make them much more real than they are. Jan Martel points this out in his book, his novel, The Life of Pi. I believe they made a movie out of it too, didn't they? The main character, Pi, finds himself adrift at sea on a 26-foot lifeboat with a 400-pound Bengal tiger as his companion. So where do you want to be? In the boat with a 450-pound tiger or in the open ocean? He's paralyzed in fear. He's trying to analyze how rational his fear of the sea and the tiger are. Listen to what he says in the book. I must say a word about fear. It is life's only true opponent. Only fear can defeat life. It's a clever, treacherous adversary. How well I know. It has no decency, respects no law or convention, and fear shows no mercy. It goes for our weakest spot, which it finds with unerring ease. It begins in our mind, always. One moment you are feeling calm, self-possessed, happy, then fear disguised in the garb of mild-mannered doubt slips into your mind like a spy. Doubt meets disbelief, and disbelief tries to push it out, but disbelief is a poorly armed foot soldier. Doubt does away with it without trouble, and then we become anxious. Reason comes to do battle, for you are reassured. Reason is fully equipped with the latest weapons of technology, but to your amazement, Despite superior tactics and a number of undeniable victories, reason is laid low. If you feel yourself weakening, wavering, your anxiety rises and it becomes dread. Quickly, you make a rash decision. You dismiss your last allies of hope and trust. There, you're now defeated. You've defeated yourself. Fear, which is but an impression, has triumphed over you. In that book, Pi realizes that fear cannot be reasoned with. Logic doesn't talk fear off the ledge or into the airplane. So what does? How can one avoid the towel in the ring surrender to the enemy? Pi gives this counsel. We must express it. We must fight hard to shine the light of words on it. Because if we don't, if our fears become wordless darkness that we avoid, perhaps even manage to forget, we open ourselves to further, stronger attacks of fear because we never truly fought the opponent who defeated us. Jesus put it into words in the garden when he told his father. Listen to the words of one of my favorite mentors growing up, Jack Williams. He's now in heaven. Jack wrote to me in an email one time. He said, it's our duty to pull back the curtains and expose our fears, each and every one of them. Like vampires, they can't stand the sunlight. Financial fears, relationship fears, professional fears, safety fears, recovery fears, fears of grief and sorrow. Call them out in prayer. Drag them out by the hand of your mind and make them stand before God and take their comeuppance. You got some fears that need their comeuppance today? Take him to your father. Jesus made his fears public. He offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. That's what the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 5, verse 7. He prayed loudly enough to be heard, and it was recorded in Scripture. And he begged his community of friends to pray with him. His prayer in the garden becomes for Christians a picture of what the church in action should look like. A place where our fears can be verbalized, pronounced, stripped down, paraded naked in the street before God the Father and denounced. An escape from the worldless darkness of suggested frights. A healthy church is where our fears should come to die. We pierce them with scripture, psalms, and worship. We melt them in the sunlight of confession. We extinguish them with the waterfall of worship, choosing to gaze at God rather than our dreads. The next time you find yourself facing a worst-case scenario moment, do this. Verbalize your angst to a trusted circle of God-seekers. This is essential. Find your version of Peter, James, and John, and just hope they stay awake longer than they did. That's why small groups are important in <coughs> church, guys. Small circle of friends when times of crisis come up. They make all the difference in the world. Small groups, good circle of friends.
make a world of difference. We shouldn't live alone with our fears. Besides, what if your fears are nothing more than a devil's hopes, a hell hatch joy stealing prank? I heard of someone who was ready to open a letter from the IRS. According to some earlier communication they had gotten from the IRS, they said that uh, these people owed them money, money he did not have to pay. He was told he could expect a letter detailing the amount and the way he could pay it. When the letter arrived, this man's courage failed him. He couldn't bear to open it, so the envelope sat on his desk for five days while he lived in dread. How much is it going to be? Where will I get the funds? I wonder how long they can send me to prison. Finally, he summoned enough gumption to open up the envelope. When he pulled out the contents, he didn't find a bill to be paid, but instead, a check to be cashed. The IRS, as it turned out, owed him a little bit of money. He had wasted five days on needless fear. There are very few monsters who warrant the fear we have of them. As believers of God, you and I have a huge asset. We know everything is going to turn out all right in the end, don't we? Heaven awaits us as believers. And you and I must remember, Christ has not budged from his throne, and Romans 8.28 is still in the book. For all things work together for good to those who love God and trust his purpose. Our problems have always been his possibilities. The kidnapping of Joseph in the Old Testament resulted in the preservation of his family and the growth of the children of Israel. The prosecution of Daniel led to a position with the king. And Christ entered this world by a surprise pregnancy and redeemed it through an unjust murder. Do you and I dare to believe what the Bible teaches? That no disaster is ultimately fatal? I don't know what you had figured when you came here today. What makes the difference between our spirits being crushed and our hearts being cheered is our perspective that God is our Father. And He cares about us. And in His presence, there is nothing to fear. Let's pray. Father, there's a high probability that over the last few minutes, there have been some fears assaulting minds and hearts of folks who are sitting here. There are some fears about, oh, I could never tell anybody about my greatest fears. Oh, God, mine's different than anybody else's. God, what will people do if I ever said anything about this? I'm convinced that quite often we're afraid of fear more than we are of things. Father, I hope in the example of Jesus we've learned a very simple truth today. And that is bring our fears to you. Crawl up in your lap and say, Abba, Father, you love me so much you gave your son. Your son loved me so much he gave his life. Here is what I'm afraid of. Put your hands over mine and steer me through it. God, another thing that's important for us to learn, I think, from this lesson is that just because we pray about a matter doesn't mean the matter will go away. It was a, I believe it was a, a missionary from a, certainly another generation who said, Lord, either lighten my load or strengthen my back. Too many times, Father, I think our prayer is just half the prayer. Lord, lighten my load. Take, take these things out of my life. Sometimes, Lord, that is not your best. It's not your best for your kingdom purpose and plan. And just as you did not remove the cup from the life of your son, you gave him what was necessary to get him through. And so, Father, today, whether our fears need to be removed, or we need to go around them, or through them, or over them, we simply trust you and let you stare down our fears for us. For ultimately, Father, all of us have heaven, our future. If we go by the name of your child. And 
and nothing is better than that. We love you. I pray that the example of your son has encouraged some of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Guys, go have a great Sunday afternoon. Oh, Stay in words. Church, five o'clock.